Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome. It's, it's great to see such a large crowd here tonight. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for coming to, uh, to this uh, October 2023 lecture. My name is Nicholas Manousis. I'm the executive director of the Horological Society of New York, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. We'll get started with some quick announcements as usual. So quick education updates. Just this past weekend, we had classes in London, and we're going to continue our, our world tour. Uh, we've got uh, three traveling dates coming up. Los Angeles, October 20th and 21st, hosted by our friends at FP Jorn. And then San Francisco, November 4th and 5th, hosted by Shreve & Co. And then uh, also with FP Jorn in Miami, November 18th and 19th. So if you have any friends or family in those cities, please let them know that we're, we're coming their way. Then, of course, our New York evening classes throughout October in this building, but upstairs on the fifth floor. And New York weekend classes on October 14th and the 21st. So we hope to see lots of, lots of you out for our, our upcoming classes. And I, I'm very happy to announce tonight that HSNY is welcoming the Watch Library Foundation as a partner organization. And now this is special. You can see this is not a sponsor, not a sponsorship. This is a partner organization because the Watch Library Foundation is a fellow nonprofit. I encourage everyone to check out their website, watchlibrary.org. The mission of the Watch Library Foundation is to digitize the world's horological libraries. And, of course, the Horological Society of New York has one of those libraries here on the fifth floor of this building. And you'll see all of our newsletters going back into the 1930s that are already digitized on their platform. It's a fantastic resource for anyone researching anything to do with horology. So I encourage everyone to, uh, to check it out, to take a look at uh, watchlibrary.org. We also have an ongoing exhibit up on the fifth floor in our, our library. It's the, uh, the watch collection of Alex Koo, and we call the exhibit Pocket Genius because it's all pocket watches, but really, really interesting, unique, special, rare pocket watches. Uh, the exhibit is open while the library is open, so Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and all are, are welcome. We have a very nice catalog that goes along with, with the exhibit that is... Uh, uh, available upstairs as well and available on our website. So um, uh, I, I just really uh, encourage everyone to come and check out this exhibit. It's just some fascinating watches there to, to take a look at. All right, on to tonight's lecture. Now, before I introduce our speaker for the evening, I'd like to ask the audience to come with me on a trip back in time. We're going to go back in time to the Gilded Age, Gilded Age New York, so the late 1800s. And there's a group of watchmakers here in New York during that time, and they decide to start an organization, an organization to help each other out, further their professional interests. And the organization quickly grows. They, they organize monthly meetings with lectures, they, uh, they put together a library, a lending library, and they even organize an annual gala dinner. And can anyone tell me, can anyone guess what the name of this organization was? Right? I, see, I hear some people laughing, so maybe you think, you think I'm, uh, I'm making a joke here, but what, what's the name of the organization? It's, it's not HSNY. It's the Ermacher Verein New Yorker. The Ermacher Verein New Yorker. I'm probably not pronouncing it right, right? But the Ermacher Verein New Yorker. That was the original name of the Horological Society of New York when we were founded in 1866. And why was that? Why did we have a German name? It's because we were founded by German immigrants to New York who happened to work in the watchmaking trade. So if you were a watchmaker in New York in the 1800s, about a 99% chance you were German. And so our, our organization had a German name, and German was the language that all the business uh, at our organization was conducted in. So fast forward, 1916, we changed the name to the Horological Society of New York to an English name. 
But it's just interesting to think that HSNY was founded by German hor horologists who came to New York, right? And tonight we're very lucky because another German horologist has come to New York, right? So please join me in welcoming our, our dear friends from Glashütte, Germany, uh, Al Lange and Zone, and we're very happy to welcome tonight Mr. Willem Schmid, the CEO of Al Lange and Zone. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. That's a good start, so we will continue in German. <laughs> Don't worry, um, I won't. I'm just back from Newport, and I've seen um, nicely what the Gilden Age uh, meant in, in the US, all these wonderful houses. And um, I'll be honest with you, I have a real challenge, you know, to explain in probably an hour um, that disrupted an interesting history that our company went through without boring those of you, and I've seen a few familiar places that probably know anything every better than I, uh, without overloading those that only know a little about us is a challenge. But let's, let's, start, let's start the journey. Um, what do we have in common a lot? You know, you see here Glashütte and New York. I think I don't need to explain who is who but you see the common denominator. You have houses, we have houses. You have the Hudson, we have the Müglitz. You have parks, we are surrounded by the forests, but I think the most important, I think there is a critical mass of people that really like watches in New York and back home in Glashütte. So, how did it all start? Um, I'll briefly touch on the origins. Um, a, a major important thing for us is design, um, which then leads into manufacturing for a reason, because we really always start with a design and not with what we have and see what we can do with it. And, um, and then we go to, you know, where are we, who, what do we stand for and, and how, what are we heading for? So let's go straight into the very early days, um, 1815, 1837. Um, I, even today, I find it fascinating that a, a small guy, uh, Ferdinand Adolf Lange, was about that size, quite fragile. He was not of great health, but he was a determined character. He really wanted to go the extra mile, came from a very poor background. His father was a gunsmith. And after all these wars in Europe, the last thing you needed was another gunsmith. So he was lucky because he was so determined and he was so talented. He found Mr. Goodcase, who sort of adopted him. In those days, education wasn't for free in Germany. Um, and he made it through the rings. And as, as the time was there, after the journeys, um, after all that, um, he had to make a very hard decision because on the one hand was the safe takeover of the family business of Goodcase, who was the, the, the royal watchmaker. You know, in those days, only the church and the royals had precise timing. Um, or start his own business. And he started his own business. And he started with a purpose. He said from the beginning, we want to build the world's best watches. He learned a lot from the French, he learned a lot from the Swiss, um, but he used that to start it work in a city, never say village, if you go to Glashütte and speak to the locals. I did that mistake a few times. <laughs> they won't like you after that, it's a city. Another similarity to New York. Um, and it, it, there was nothing because, you know, they lived from, from silver ores and, and they were just empty. There was nothing and it's a valley in the mountains. So agricultural business, not great there. Uh, there was no hope. There was no future until he came. He got a loan from the government, which he paid back. Uh, but he started with a watchmaker's school and then very quickly with the 15 first students, he started building the world's best watches. And, and he really did. Um, him, and then later on, most important, and that's why 
uh, I'm sure you all know what A Lange und Söhne stands for. Do you all know? You know this, I see a few, so because it's German, unfortunately. It means Adolf Lange und and his sons, Söhne, which stands for sons. So he was very lucky because he had two great sons, Emil and Richard, and they were good in different aspects. The one was a shrewd businessman and the other a great engineer, and they shared the company and really, really brought it to another level. Um, the, the, the nice watch you see on the left, um, so we served, uh, you know, the wealthy people at the time, which were usually the royals. Um, so we did it for um, the Tsar, we did it for uh, the German Emperor Wilhelm, that's my name, it died with him. There are very few Wilhelms today, <laughs> at least at my age. Um, and, and the watch on the right hand side, I sometimes detour from the presentation, but that's such an interesting uh, history. Uh, it was made for the Paris World Show in 1900. Um, it was uh, bought by um, a very wealthy person who grew up in Bautzen and then lived in Dresden, not far from where I live today. Today it's sort of the, it's an official building from the government, beautiful. And as he passed away because he had no children, he gave his, his properties to Dresden and his pocket watch collection to Bautzen. And then, you know, in the times of reunification and before, that whole collection got stolen. And nobody did know where it was. Um, this particular watch went on auction in Switzerland, uh, in, in, in Zurich, in about eight, uh, 1986, 87. Um, I think it was 1.8 million Swiss franc paid for it. Um, but it was before reunification, and because the communists never participated on the list of stolen goods, so the watch could be auctioned before unification, but not after unification. So after reunification, it was once more time back, and we alarmed the uh, people from the museum and said the watch is back, um, and now the watch is back in Bautzen. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing that watch working for the very last time ever because it's a very original watch. We completely maintained it, uh, made it working, did some movies of that watch and then blocked it so that it can't work to protect it, you know, to preserve it because every time it would run, it would be destroyed a little bit and it is so damn original that we said no, not away. So that's a nice size story. Um, there was a time, if they say a time in crisis, it, it basically means, you know, the, the, the company was expropriated like all other com companies in, in Glashütte. Um, they formed the Parastatal, which is formed Glashütte Uhrenbetriebe, um, GUB. I'm sure you find watches with that sort of uh, headline. And, and basically, we, we, we stopped existing. Um, Mr. Walter Lange fleet. It wasn't fleeing then because there was no wall, but he decided not to work in uh, the uranium mines. He was supposed to go there and uh, the average survival years were about two. So you don't want to work there. So gladly he didn't because uh, straight after reunification, him and Mr. Blumlein, which was, uh, you know, sometimes the, the, in, at the right moment, the right people meet. And here were two. The one, uh, Mr. Blumlein, that was the brain, and Mr. Lange was the heart. And the two together, they really restarted something. And trust me, it wasn't clear in the beginning. There was no success expected to the extent that the machines we bought, the desks we bought, were equal to those that IWC used in Switzerland. So, had it not worked out, they could have shipped all that to Switzerland and minimized the damage. So, there was no guarantee, because if you had a chance to see how Glashütte looked like in the early 90s, you would have not expected that this ever will fly. However, um, however, 
I'm a watch fan. I bought my first watch at the age of 17. And I'll never forget the newspaper, for those of you a bit younger than me, internet didn't exist back then. So newspaper, you open it, and the headline are these four watches with own movements in the early 90s. That was far from normal. The usual suspects, even the high end, they had movements from Swatch, from ETA, from God knows what. But hardly anybody was producing their own watches, their own movements. And here comes somebody out of nowhere and comes with four new movements on purpose. Um, I always say without the Lange One, I wouldn't stay here. Glashütte wouldn't exist. And Alange and Söhne wouldn't work. Um, but to have, forgive me, the balls to come with a 100,000 German Mark watch in 1994 was outstanding. I couldn't believe it. I wanted desperately a Lange One. It was just too expensive for me. I went for the first 1815 years later. But, you know, to see out of Germany, out of Eastern Germany, four watches, you have no idea of the impact. The impact is so strong that even today, I mean, all these watches are very, very sought after. Do you have any idea why they came up with the arcade? Partly. You could not buy a square movement in those days. So if you come up with a watch that looks like this, it was 100% clear that was your own development because it wasn't available on the market. And the second thing is, I mean, even today, you look at this watch and you look at the huge date. It looks like a miracle. Now, how can they get this big date in that small watch? So, ladies partly right, but the real statement was, we do our own movements. And, of course, the outsized date um, is, is quite uh, a statement, even in a small, on a small watch. There are many watches that I can talk about, and I will. But for sure, those that we're into watches in 2009 as we launched the Zeitwerk. Who was into watches back then? Who did like that watch in the beginning? Very few. Trust me. There, was, uh, there were discussions. They lost it. Jesus, how can you, how can you build a watch with a digital display? Um, if you proud yourself to do only mechanical watches, how on earth can you be so stupid? So, again, that watch was not a home run in the beginning. It took quite a while for people to understand. On top of that, because of the quite complicated movement that is in there and the massive power you need to make discs jumping and stopping accurately, uh, it also deserved a certain size. You know, the real estate of that watch is, is quite big. Um, so all that together wasn't easy. Today it looks like, yes, of course, you know, why not? Nobody does it so far. You know, you will finally have any instantaneously jumping uh, digital watches in the market, and there's a good reason. It looks simple. It is far from simple. It's a watch which is very unforgiving for the watchmaker. Any tiny little mistake and it just simply doesn't work. It's not forgiving. Further on, um, how often do you have the chance to say proudly you can launch the most complicated German wristwatch ever produced? That's what we did in 2013. Um, I know it looks like a 42500, which was the most complicated pocket watch uh, that we ever produced, but trust me, these pocket watches, they were more to impress. Unfortunately, the mechanisms in that, they usually didn't work that well. So we had to re-engineer everything, but we wanted to maintain the phase. So we came up with the grand complication um, at those days, SIHH. Um, and it was 
again, a subtle answer to a question. Because the question was always raised, what can we do? You know, where is the limit of what you can develop? And we thought instead of going step by step, we just come with the one ring that rules it all. And you come with something which has from Petit Grand Sonnery, Minute Repeater, a very complicated chronograph with a, with, a, with a very complicated second hand, Perpetual calendar, uh, fusi and chain. So, you know, it's just a tourbillon that we couldn't fit in. Um, but, you know, sometimes I also believe fusi and chain and a tourbillon is a bit of an overkill. Um, that, that's why we do that from time to time. We came closer to 2019. And again, I think by now you're all on board with watches. Who liked that watch in the beginning? Be honest. Who didn't like it in the beginning? Who still doesn't like it? Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's never meant to be. You know, you can't just produce five and a half thousand watches, but come up with mainstream products that have a little bit for everybody. It just doesn't work. This was never meant to be a competitor to, I don't name them. It was always an answer to our collectors that said, we love your watches, but at the most precious time we have, weekends, vacation, playing with the children, going out there, we just don't dare wearing a precious metal watch with a leather strap. And I think it's more the leather strap that bothered them than anything else. So that's the answer. It was never meant because we can't produce that. You know, we will have limited capacity for that watch because it competes with the longer one. That's from a watchmaking uh, uh, complication capacity. That's the same bracket. And, you know, we can't deliver the longer one. So why would we now move capacity to the Odysseus? That wouldn't make sense. Um, however, um, that is, well, that's very interesting in design, because design, I think it's the most important thing. We have six families, as you probably know, and they all stand for something. Um, and the Odysseus, as well, was a new playground for us. Um, interesting question, you know, you will remember, I mean, I'm a little longer in that job, and sometimes that means you meet the sins of the things you said in the past. And I don't know how many times I said there will never be a steel langer. I was young then. <laughs> um, however, the Odysseus allows that without neglecting or redefining what we stand for with all the other watch families. So there will be no steel watch in the other five families. There will also be no fancy material in the other five families. But we're always good for a surprise with the Odysseus because it allows, it's made for it. That's, what we, that's why we created it and that's for what we use it. But let's have a look. Um, I think to, to talk about the Lange One, um, you know, if, if, if whoever is here and has never seen a Lange One, probably see it by mistake. Because it's around now for 29 years. It's basically unchanged. We put a new movement in in 2015 because you remember as we started, we had to buy a lot of parts like the hair spring from other companies because we weren't able back then to produce everything ourselves. And that uh, eventually, you know, we said, Tony said, we need to change that. The icon or the watch that epitomizes everything we stand for needs to come with our own hairspring. And I know my glass hit the people, if they start somewhere, they don't finish there. They just go on through it, but they didn't touch the design. The design today is exactly the design that we had back then. And let me clear a myth, you know, the, 
the made in Germany big print and small print, I have to say it's all nonsense, different suppliers. It was never on purpose. It is just that these printing machines over time, you know, they just lose a bit of sharpness. And that's why sometimes the print is a bit thicker and sometimes the print is a bit thinner. And of course, today we have different suppliers than we had back then. So it's not a design element, it is simply different suppliers. That's why it's so difficult today to reproduce a dial that looks exactly like a dial that we did, um, let's say, in 1994, 5, 6 or 7. That's a phenomenon which is, you know, the whole industry is facing because dials age um, and also the, uh, the labor protection today doesn't allow all the materials that we might could have used back then. So there are limits to that, not imposed by us, but imposed by regulation. You know what the problem is with a strong design? It can be a cage as well. Because once you have that very, very strong design, how do you develop it without diluting the original design? You know, how do you put complications in it and it still looks on the first glimpse like a Lange one or like an Odysseus? So never underestimate, you have to start very early in thinking about what is the next step of your design. So if you look at the Lange one family, you can clearly see from, you know, the, the, the original Lange one to the most complicated, which probably is the Lange one perpetual tourbillon from a little longer one, and I think it was a genius idea from Mr. Blumlein to say that the automatic movement is just mirroring the original design. And I don't know how many people do not see on the first glimpse that if you put these watches next to each other, that they're actually just mirroring each other. I think these are tiny little things, but to maintain the integrity of design deserves that you think out of the box. And I think the perpetual calendar, um, whoever is familiar with the design of a typical perpetual calendar, they use a 48-month wheel, which is always in the center. Almost all perpetual calendars work like that, like a mechanical programmation program software. But you can't do that in a decentralized watch. So we had to come up with a with a mechanism that allows decentralized but jumping, instantaneously jumping uh, indications that you need for, for all the different watches. Interesting question, um, and here comes the answer. Why is the new Perpetual calendar just a little fraction smaller than the Perpetual Tourbillon Lange one? Do you know it? I shared with you because the original design had a day-night indication. The new perpetual calendar's day-night indication is in the moon phase. And that is adding a little height, which, is then, which then means the watch is almost as high, if you look at it, than the original Lange 1 perpetual calendar. And that's, again, often the compromise that we have to do. You know, you want it as slim and small and legible and readable and comfortable and waterproof as possible, but all indications at the same time. And that's where usually the designer and the people from the construction department have hairy moments because what the one want is impossible to do for the others. So it's an endless fight. Um, and i give you a few more examples for that. Um, I know that a lot of people, collectors say, potentially our watches are slightly bigger than those of our partners in Switzerland. And that's true. And usually it's true because for two or three reasons. The one is, we're German, we love things to work. And we love them robust. And usually we all know, you know, if you want something to be robust, you, you better don't be shy with the material. The second thing is all our watches are waterproof. 
minute repeater. I know it's stupid to make a minute repeater waterproof because obviously you catch the sound instead of releasing it, but you know, we didn't want um, that a drop of water whilst washing your hands may get into uh, the case, into the movement and destroys what we so hard worked on, so we did it. The third element, and, and that's an interesting one, who loves the golden chatons, the best ones, they are screwed with these three little blue steel screws. I think whoever has a Langer knows, love it. Unfortunately, they look good, but you need meat, you need height, otherwise you can't put these screws in. So the moment you make it slimmer, you can't do that. So again, it's a question of compromise. What do you want? Do you want a very slim watch and get rid of all this decoration? Or do you say, I'll take the price, I'll make them slightly higher, but what is more beautiful than these cornflower blue little screws around a golden chaton that are just hiding that little ruby? I think the three colors are such a nice, but again, it comes at a, it comes at a price. Outsize date is a thing that we have in quite a few watches. Trust me, if you come to my age and your eye view you know, is deteriorating, you come to appreciate it. So the younger ones, your time will come and then you will love it. Uh, the Saxonia is covering a, 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 a lot of variety here. And I'll be bluntly honest again, we call it Saxonia if you talk to collectors, they would call it datograph, triple split. Um, they will probably call the first watches Saxonia, um, but for sure the lower end, we put them into that family, but frankly they have almost a standalone character, specifically the chronographs or the Lange 31. It's quite interesting, the Lange 31 is now about, I think it's 15 years old, we're still the only ones that produce it. Um, and again, those of you that are a bit longer in watchmaking, you can remember the fight for getting the month power reserve. There were quite a few players in the market. They always launched a watch which I've never seen on anybody's wrist. I wonder why. I wonder why. Zeitwerk, again, think about what I said about design. Strong design, hey, but if you don't want to put complications into it, you better have an idea. Um, here, of course, it's very nice to see um, the acoustics that we play with, you know, be it the, um, the striking time or be it the minute repeater, because it's on the dial. So it's a very attractive thing because you can see the mechanism. Most minute repeater you can't see, unless you turn the watch around. Here it's the music plays really in, in the face. I will not go through all the details that went into that watch because that alone is good for an hour. Um, but it is a spectacular watch. If you take all the things it does differently to any other minute repeater into consideration. And again, as we launched it, we did it on purpose because after the grand complication, Everybody did expect the next watch they launch is a classical minute repeater. You know, like the Richard Lange minute repeater, which we then launched much later. But we came with something with a decimal repeater, which is totally different. The date, um, again, where do you put a date? Because all the real estate in the front is covered by the discs. Um, there's no getting through, so you have to find a way to put it around it again. Um, don't ask me about the lumen, I should not say it, because we, we just go, we just move on. <laughs> to what I would call, if we would still produce pocket watches, that's how they would look like. So the 1815 design language is the most traditional, is the most classical design language that we use. And it's meant to be like this. Um, all of these watches, you know, if you just make them a bit bigger, they, could, they would look like pocket watches. Very traditional, all the design elements, no outsized date. You will never see an outsized date 
on the 1815 because that would actually break with the design code of that specific um, family. The Richard Lange, the oddball even in our collection. Because here we do things you wouldn't usually do. Um, it's regulator dials, um, it's tourbillons that you see and then you can't see again. Um, it's, it's, for me, the most beautiful watch that unfortunately I cannot wear because it's too big for me, the Terra Luna. Um, you know, it's such a two faces, um, it's a technical little miracle, you know, with 14 hours power reserve, perpetual calendar, instantaneously jumping, um, the, the, the um, orbital moon phase indication on the back. That's, that's a real, real statement watch. Again, if you are, if you have good hands, you may be able to wear it. I, unfortunately, be too small for it, but for me, it's an outstanding watch. The minute repeater, there was always debates, um, you know, can we produce a classical minute repeater that com can compete with the best? I can guarantee you, yes, you have to hear it. And never forget, it's waterproof to 3 ATM. For those of you that don't think that is important, if you wash your hands and a drop of water hits your crown, unfortunately, water is quite clever. It'll make it into your movement, and I don't need to tell you what happens to steel parts if they're exposed to water. So we don't want that, but we are pretty alone with that idea in the market. However, I know that this watch can compete with those that do minute repeater for a long, long time. And the one thing we always openly admit, minute repeater were not a speciality of Glashütte. Not back in the old days, and it took us a long time to understand how minute repeater work. Um, and we didn't have the privilege to go up under the roof into our archives and see what we had there because there is no roof and there was no archive. So we had to really start from scratch. Right, Odysseus again uh, creating a face, a recognizable face, um, a watch that you would spot from distance. Those that know about the discussion, is that an integrated bracelet or not? I can assure you it is. Um, there was a golden rule by Mr. Blumlein that said, you know, if you look under the sleeve, you need to identify an Alange and Söhne from the distance. And that's why even an arcade or a cabaret, you know, the, the rectangular watches that we once produced, if you look from the side, they have exactly the same looks, they have exactly the same crown, they appear like a Lange has to appear. And we didn't want to throw that just to make people believe, oh yes, an integrated bracelet. You know, that's why it is integrated, but it doesn't look like, because we wanted to maintain that typical Lange und Söhne look. Um, again, if you want to create that, strong, recognizable design, unique, not another Gerard Genta watch, stick to what you stand for, you know, do your own movement, um, and that movement we can only use in that watch, believe it or not. There is no other watch that we could use that movement for, and we can't use any movement of the other watches for that watch. Um, so again, that limits our output, that limits what we can produce. And of course, it imposes challenges on the construction team because how can you work with that and create a family? And, and yes, I admit, the movement of the first three watches is pretty much the same. It's stainless steel, it's rubber or leather strap, you can change that quickly, and titanium. But the Odysseus chronograph, which we only launched in April, looks immediately like an Odysseus, but it's a chronograph. Quite a complicated on top of that. So that's a good, another good example of if you stick to a design, 
you need to understand the implications and you need to understand it will come with challenges when you start creating a family out of an original and very strong design. We always do something to make the life of our watchmaker really miserable. Really miserable. So first, I always have a little test. Who knows what Handwerkskunst stands for? Not you, because you speak German. Fantastic, that's exactly. And we do in these watches everything which we cannot do to the same extent in normal production, because it would be ridiculous. You know, even the movements, the shape of the movements are designed to make the life of the people that need to decorate it very, very tough. Um, we, use that, we use that to push boundaries within the factory. You know, it's like, it's like a sports or a sportsman that you push into a new area. That's, that's, you know, it's very important for us, not for collectors, that's not a business case because far too much work goes into each and any of these watches. But, but our people see that there is no limit. They test what they can do. And the Handwerkskunst always takes new stuff. Um, I'll never forget we had the brilliant idea on this one to build in what we call a Glashütte escapement. So the whole escapement is made out of gold. And there's a very good idea why they stopped doing that, which we didn't know. It's hard work because gold is the least material you should use for an escapement. However, we went through that, a lot of struggle, but these watches are really, I think that, you know, if you are a real, real watch collector, I admit they are pretty expensive. But, you know, then you really understand what human beings can do. It's the extra mile. The engraving and enamel dial combination here, you know, anything goes wrong, thousands of euros you can just throw away. Because even if the last step goes wrong, you can't repair anything of that. You just start from scratch again. Um, enamel is a good question because uh, enamel was dead art. Nobody needed enamel anymore. There were no books. Unfortunately, there were no people that could still do it. So we had to start from scratch to understand how you produce enamel. It took us three years to find a glass producer that produced a glass as clean so that we could use this use this to make enamel dials. The black enamel dial of the Lange 1 2014, I'll never forget, back then they worked very close to my office, that little department, and I went there and I saw the lady with a white sheet, light, and all that black stuff, and she was taking out anything not black. It was hairy, you know, to see it, and then you know, to build it, to produce it, and if the last step doesn't work, you just throw it away. There's nothing you can do. So, again, for us, this is more than just something to please collectors. For us, that's the birth of all new things that we didn't do before and that we want to do. And we will continue to push boundaries on, on that stuff. The Lumen, again, they shouldn't give me these charts. They usually ask for trouble. It started uh, with the Zeitwerk. Back then it was, I think the collectors call it the Phantom. We wanted to name it Phantom. And then we got a nice letter from Rolls Royce. <laughs> then we called it Luminous. And two years later, Angelo Bonatti said, you don't do that again. So we called it Lumen, and ever since then, <laughs> we call it Lumen. Um, again, it gives just our design a little contemporary look. Um, for those of you 
these crystals are very hard to work with. You know, to produce, and that's what we do in-house, to produce the dials, print them. Any little mistake, glue or not, they either break or you see the glue. Um, specifically, if it gets a bit complicated, like the datagraph lumen up and down, or uh, the Zeitwerk lumen, you know, where you have these sharp edges, anything, the tiniest little movement in it, and it will break. Um, I never forget, we once were very clever, as we launched different, different dial, but similar story, as we launched the little Lange One Moon Phase with the Aventurine dial, we thought this time we are more clever, we pre-produce dials. So once we have the movement, you know, we just assemble the watches and off we are. So we produced a hundred dials, put them safely into, you know, these, these special cabinets that are built for it. We produced the movements and then we took the hundred dials out, 76 were broken. 76 were broken and we had no idea why. Nobody touched it. That is absolute climate control, temperature control. 76 were broken and 14 were broken in the process of assembly. So instead of having 100 watches, we had 10. That's why if you wait for one of these watches, there's a reason for it. Um, so th these are tiny little things because often it looks like so easy. Most of the time it just looks easy because somebody did it and it's years of training. Um, if you try to replicate it, it usually doesn't work as good. Chronographs, our speciality, I have a huge sweet spot for chronographs. You know, I think 80% of my collection are chronographs. I just love them. And I also frankly share with you the main reason I use them is to cook the Sunday morning eggs. And they are really good. They're very precise. I know exactly how to set them. But it's just so lovely to see that, you know, what's happening on the dial. Um, and chronographs for us are really important, again, pushing boundaries. You're all familiar with the concept that they actually say there are three big complications. Perpetual, um, tourbillon, and minute repeater, or anything with acoustic. And I'm absolutely with anybody that said acoustic. They are really a different a different category. That is really very, very complicated. If you ask our watchmaker, rather the chronograph rattrapant, a perpetual calendar or tourbillon, most of them will immediately say perpetual and tourbillon is a lot easier. To set up a chronograph properly, and I will just invite you, if you push the buttons on our chronographs, that feeling, you know, that soft feeling, and then the moment it's activated, that's not due to design, that is due to the craftsmanship of that assembler, of the watchmaker. Because he needs to adjust it all properly to get that distinguished, you know, uh, you know exactly activated without being too hard, without being too soft. And all three, I don't know if, you, if you have a, a chronograph rattrapant or a normal chronograph too, all three in the same way. Because sometimes you have to push the start hard, and the stop is very, very sort of easy or other. They have to be exactly the same. It's not, you know, we can't do that with the way we produce our, our, our movements. That's down to the watchmaker that assembles it. Yeah, and this is the work of uh, a lot of great people over the years of time. That's all the movements, the different movements that we launched since 1994. Um, this year at uh, Watches and Wonders, we had a display of all the 71 different movements, and it was the most expensive single box on the whole booth because the money behind that is immense. Um, but again, even in current collection, I think we have 33 or 36 different movements. Um, so whenever you wait for a watch, there's a reason. It's just because we cannot mass produce. And there's always a movement for each and every watch. 
Um, and a watchmaker can work on two, three movements, efficiency, usually on one if you really want it efficient. Even if a good watchmaker moves from one movement to another, he or she will take time before she goes back to become really good and quick on it. Um, it's, there, are, there are movements designed to be assembled by somebody that has any sort of training, and there are movements that are designed to be assembled by a watchmaker. And the second is definitely the case for us. I'm not saying good or bad. That's the difference between a four-cylinder Golf and a 12-cylinder Ferrari. They're both engines, but they're very different. And I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's just saying it's different, and that's why we can produce 5,500 watches. But unfortunately, and trust me, I'm a businessman. I would rather produce 10,000 because we could sell them, but we can't produce them. So that's unfortunate, but it's you know, due to the complexity that I just shared with you. Uh, traditional elements, they all have, and again, I always give that to Mr. Blumlein and Mr. Lange, because they really are the father of all these things. They are in our rule book, um, and nobody will break it. You know, all our watches have a hand-engraved balance cock, like our pocket watches had. Wherever doable, we use these, uh, I talked about it, these beautiful little golden chatons, sometimes with two screws, sometimes with three screws, and it's just, you know, the color combination is just unbelievable. Um, we use only German silver for the ground plates. That's a beautiful material, because over time it will develop that mellow, golden patina. The problem is, because we use it untreated, the moment you breathe on it, or you touch it, it will develop a very ugly patina, because on those, that's when, and I can only warn anybody, don't give it to people not authorized to work on it. Alkis is, you know, a good man. He knows, he knows what to do, because if you give it to somebody that's not used to work on that material, trust me, the damage that he or she will cause is a lot higher than what you think you need to pay when you send the watch through Alkis or to us. Um, not everybody can work with it, and if you come to our manufacturer, you will see that nobody, nobody in any watch department is working not with protected fingers. There's no way. That's why we have an own school. I'll come to that later. Um, typical example of um, how, to, how to make life really difficult, just imagine, you know, that's always a 45 degree angle. Um, now, if you put a bit too much there, you can throw it away. There's no way to repair it. Um, if you, you know, these little corners, they are an absolute nightmare. I'll never forget, as I started a uh, long time back, because I came from the car industry, um, I went all, every day in with the early shift, and then I went along the factory as a watch would do. And I tried to do what my people were doing. And I can assure you, none of the parts that I ever worked on made it into any watch. So if there's a mistake, it wasn't me. But it's horrendous, you know. I, one little story, these golden chatons, they have to be polished to absolutely match the surface. So there is, there is a reason that they do it. Now, polishing these tiny little things is really complicated. So I went there, and she said, polish, and I polished. And after two minutes, I said, I have no idea what you always tell me. Look at it, it looks brilliant. So she looked at it, and she said, nine. I said, what do you mean by nine? I said, there are nine scratches on that tiny little thing. And then the first thing, she taught me how to work with the light reflection to see whether it's really mirror or not. After three quarters of an hour, and for sure I was out of any tolerance, there wasn't a lot left, to be honest. I got back, and she said, it's almost perfect. I was so proud. There is a little shadow here. If you get that away, you're done. So I thought the shadow is gone. I gave it to her. She looked at me and said, Two. 
That's where the moment said, I have to go back to office. <laughs> right, we have all these different decoration techniques. I will not go into any of them. Um, I'll take one of the most difficult ones, which is called black polish. Any idea why it's called black polish? No. That's, if you look into something, you usually see the light reflection. So that's why, you know, if there's any, any uh, uh, uneven area, you see the light reflection. Our eyes, even your eyes, they don't shine. They actually have no light. So if you look into something which is completely even, it will appear black because there is no light reflection. That's why it's called black polishing. It's also something which I would not recommend for people with uh, soft nerves. It's nerve-wracking because you do it for hours and then there's a, you know, sometimes in the material you have a, a little um, opening, a little thing where the, 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 the metal isn't completely homogeneous. You can throw it away. And sometimes after two or three days of work, because that's how long it takes to get, you know, simple, well, it's not simple, that's highly complicated things like that, really black polished. The hand engraved balance cock I talked about, it's always nice, you know, on events, um, we often have an engraver. Um, and engraving is a little bit like handwriting. So they can see clearly which engraver uh, did a watch. So if you come with your watch, they look at it and they say this uh, Ms. Raufus uh, or Helmut Koch. So they can just look at it and give a certificate with the signature of that. And we have clever customers that do it at different events to different engraver just to check whether it's not only a marketing story. It isn't. They can really distinguish between each other. Double assembly, yeah, why can't we get it right the first time? <laughs> it's very easy. There are two aspects to it. The one is, and I said it before, our movements are designed for watchmaker. So they will adjust all the little parts so that they work perfectly. Once that is established, it will go through a test process, quite an extensive one. If all is well, it will go back to the watchmaker. He or she will disassemble it, clean it, put the final decoration on, because now he or she knows that all the tolerances, all the adjustments are perfect. Then they will assemble it, will encase it, and then it will go through the test work again. And by doing so, we assure two things. First of all, the return quote, so the mistake, and it can always happen because it's people that work on it. I have to say that, you know, there is no, as, as hard as we strive, it's the product of human hands and mistakes may occur and sometimes we can't see them. You can only see them after transport, after two months on, on, on the wrist. But with that process, we ensure that this happens very, very rarely and to get the aesthetics perfect. Yeah. Remember the German silver, very difficult to work with. With that, we can assure that the aesthetics of the movement parts is on par with the engineering uh, quality of the watch. That's why we do the double assembly. Lange outsize date goes back to the Semper Opera. Uh, oh, I've spent many, oh, you have to Sometimes these operas, when you think, Jesus, why did you go there? And then you see to your wife and you know why you were there. That watch, you know, you look at it and it only gives every five minutes. You have no idea how long five minutes can be if the opera is not great. <laughs> I'm not sure whether they had the same inspiration, but they took this outsize date uh, because it was quite unusual back then in 94 and and up to today you know on, on, on many of our really known watches you will see the outsized date 
Fusi and Chain, again, first watch, first wrist watch with Fusi and Chain in 1994. I think it does rather well in auctions in today's world. Um, Fusi and Chain, you familiar with the system? Yes? Exactly. You know, the biggest challenge is, you all know, when we were boys, we had these cars that you pulled back, they were spring-loaded, you release them, they're very quick in the beginning, very slow at the end. A watch has exactly the same problem. as a spring, which is, of course, has a different torque in the beginning than at the end. So that's why most springs only work within a certain parameter, where, you know, the tolerances are in line with the accuracy that you want to produce with a watch. Constant force mechanisms, and there are different ones, um, this is a very traditional one. Try to give always the same amount of power into the movement. So it's prob I think it's more accurate than what a tourbillon can do because you know the gravity may be strong, but it's not creating the same sort of mistake that can be created by different uh, um, amount of torques that go into the movement. And this is like fusi and chain for the moment. Um, the spring torque reduces, the lever on the other side get bigger, so, and vice versa. So by that, you assure that always the same amount of, of torque goes into the movement. Again, a tiny little thing uh, on the small subdials on the chronographs. Most of the chronographs, they have sort of a slowly walking minute hand. Um, on the small dials, that can quickly become a problem because you don't see, is it two minutes or three minutes or 16 or 17? Um, that's why the datograph traditionally has a jumping minute counter. Then it's pretty clear whether it's one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. So you can see the seconds, but you can see clearly the minutes. We talked about that. You know, we produce our own balance spring, um, it, it's very important, it's the heart of the watch, you know, that will determine together with the pairing of the, uh, the balance wheel how accurate a watch potentially will be. If you get that wrong, is, is it five micrometer and then it's wrong by half an hour or something like this? You know, it is just incredible. You don't get that right, you can forget all the rest. Um, that's why very few companies produce their own half spring. I would say even today, I would say 80% get it from ETA. Um, probably even more. You know, but, but, you know, we decided very early on that's something because the heart of the watch we want to do ourselves. Um, that's why we invested. And after 12 years of investment, you know, slowly but surely, we, we, we use them for our own watches. We discussed that. That's a good, a good example of, you know, if you, if you want to launch a Lange one with a perpetual calendar, you can't have, you don't have a center. So you have to find a different way of creating 48 a different month. And in this case, it's the peripheral month ring around it, which jumps by 30 degrees instantaneously um, at around midnight. Um, again, to maintain the design, you have to be very clever with your mechanisms. And you can nicely see here the moon phase. Uh, you may wonder why there are stars and why there are no stars. It's very easy. If you look now to the sky, you will see stars. If you do that throughout the day, there are no stars. So we use this as a day-night indication, which is important because you want to set a perpetual calendar in a way that everything jumps at midnight and not during lunch break. Constant force equipment, we set one with the uh, fusi and chain. Um, another one which you can see here, um, it's, it's, it's uh, the, um, one of the Zeitwerk. And again, what we always do is we learn. The first idea of that constant force came actually from the Lange 31. Um, you can understand the hairspring to generate 31 days of power reserve 
has to be rather strong. There's a limit to what you can do with the power without destroying the rest of the movement. So you had to become clever. So you have a main barrel and a small one. So the main barrel always loads the small one, which then gives the energy, which is now divided by a lot, into the movement. Um, we use it for the jumping second, the Richard Lange. Um, we use it for the Zeitwerk, always for the same reason, control power. You need a lot of power, but you have to give it con in a controlled way. And these constant force escapements, they are perfectly, they're perfect for that. Right. That's a hot topic. You know, how do you, how do you create proximity? We, we're a small company. We want to know each other. We want to know who eventually buys our watches. Um, and, and we came to realize that with 260 points of sales, that's literally not doable, not possible. On top of that, we have no watches. So how do you find that fine balance uh, between having a good representation of what you stand for, but still, still, you know, be close to your customer. You're all safe. We have a boutique in New York, but, you know, the next one is then Boston. So don't, don't move. We're in between. It's a long journey. Um, it is, you know, and I always say it's, it's a balanced decision. We would rather have more, but we can't do it because we don't have watches. Um, so this setup is a good footprint um, where we can ensure on the one hand that we're not too far away from our customers and on the other hand that we have not too many point of sales and therefore each and every point of sale that you see here has a good representation of our um, brand. This is the new flagship store uh, very close by um, at Madison Avenue. I'm sure you all have been there or you go there, probably, hopefully. Um, we have a soft, a sweet spot for vintage cars events, to be precise, for Concours d'Elegance, for a very easy reason. Uh, I'm just back from our first American um, Concours d'Elegance down in Newport, uh, the Audrain uh, Concours of Elegance. And if you look at these cars, they have three things. They're all hand-built. They all have a great story. And they all have a design which even today, you look at it and you wonder why they don't produce cars like that anymore. And if that sounds familiar, that's very much what we want to create with our watches as well. That's why it's not car racing, it's not you know vintage racing, it's concour of elegance, which we said that's the only playground where we entertain customer, but where we also come to realize we will see a lot of new friends um, because mechanical art and collectors um, is a good uh, ground for us to recruit new clients um, and also customers that we have like it a lot to be with us there. Give you an idea about uh, the heart of the craftsmanship. We are back to, it's not New York, it's Glashütte. I know you get confused, but that's Glashütte. Um, and just a fraction of the people that work there, actually we are 600 uh, that only work in a factory to produce these, these wonderful watches and to ensure that there's a future for fine watchmaking in Glashütte. We decided 26 years back to have our own watchmaker school. So we train our own people. It's a government program, so they work for us, they work with us, but all the exams are taken by, um, by the authorities uh, to ensure that you know, with a watchmaker degree from Alang und Sön, you can go elsewhere as well. It's 70 minutes, I'm not there yet. I am, I am. I could have done it a lot quicker, and i show you how I could have done it a lot quicker.
If you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Ich habe nicht daran gedacht, dass es je wieder dazu kommt, dass wir lange Uhren bauen. Und dann kam doch äh, völlig unvorbereitet die Wiedervereinigung. Ich bin wohl mit den Worten angetreten, wir wollen wieder die besten Uhren der Welt bauen. Wir sind halt angetrieben von dem Drang, das Unmögliche möglich zu machen. Okay, so we've, we've uh, come to that time, time of the evening for Q&A. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. I'll bring the microphone to you. All right, we'll start over here. Thank you. That was an excellent performance and presentation. I do have a question about the period during the East German period, the, the watchmaking. I, my understanding is the factory was nationalized. Yes. It was taken over. Now, the watchmakers, what type of watches were made at the factory? And, and was it based on consignment or was it a market driven commodity? No, no it was those, commodity, yeah. And was it a quality? How was the quality of the watches? And when you went to transition back yeah. to private ownership, the, yeah. Was it the same watchmakers still working with you? Did they have to be retrained? What was that transition like? No, not, not now anymore because they would be too old and some of them really worked long for us. Don't forget reunification. That's uh, um, 33 years ago. Um, what they did during 
the communist times is they produced relatively inexpensive watches. For the Russians, they were still pretty expensive, but they were rather simple, no decoration. Um, and what they did a lot is to gain currency, hard currency, that did uh, work for department stores. So if you want your own watch with a cheap movement, inexpensive, I should say, because cheap would be wrong, but no decoration, nothing, they would do that for that, for, for you. And of course, with that, they, they generated much needed um, Western currencies. So there was always uh, um, watchmaking in the valley. But to give you an idea, at the end, the GUB, GUB um, had about 2,500 employees. Um, and it was sort of, you know, it was in the business model that was uh, very quickly uh, bankrupt. Um, and the rest were bought by um, Glashütte Original. And there they were then bought from uh, by, by Swatch Group. So the legal successor of the GUB, of the parastatal, you know, nationalized uh, company, is Glashütte Original. No, we had to train. Yeah, we had a lot of them, um, the good ones, yes. But don't forget, if you work your whole... I mean, for, for me, one of the biggest job that Mr. Blumlein and Mr. Lange did is to explain to people that produced watches that were sold for 40 or 50 German marks and then, you know, to upgrade them you know, mentally, you just need to understand, you work your life in a system where marketing and sales didn't play a role, where you just worked. You know, whether you produced anything that is needed or not, who cares? And now very suddenly, and, and I think Mr. Lange said it very nicely, we were all not prepared for that. Not Western Germany, nor Eastern Germany. Very suddenly that wall dropped, and these people were exposed to a world and they were definitely not geared up to deal with it. So the, the, many, the transformation of these people to what they are today started with Mr. Blumlein and Mr. Lange. For me, it's an absolute miracle. Um, it's, it's still work, but of course they laid down the foundation. We just, we just work on their foundations. Um, and you're absolutely right, uh, that, that was probably the biggest challenge. And some made it, many didn't. Pleasure. All right, let's go here. Thank you for that tremendous presentation. Um, the, the few times I've had the pleasure of actually holding one of your watches in my hand, I'm always astonished by the quality and the craftsmanship. Um, that being said, can you promise us all here tonight that we will never see a $400 plastic Langa on a, <laughs> on a Velcro strap? Yes, or yes. Bio With no hesitation, hesitation, yes. <laughs> and I've seen that thing on Instagram where they made the Zeitwerk, sort of that sort of <laughs> plastic, but don't worry, only over my dead body. <laughs> Uh, what is uh, being part of a huge conglomerate, Richemont, meant in terms of your ability to run the business the way you want to? And given you're such a young man, in 10 years from now, when you're making this lecture, what are you going to be saying about Langa that's different than you told us today? Well, first of all, just, you know, let's take away a big misconception. Whether you are independent and you work for the banks or your stakeholders or you work in a big company, then you have other stakeholders. But to believe that you can run your business as you wish is maybe not a healthy business preposition. You will always, you will always have to follow certain stakeholders and beat your customers. The great thing at Richemont is they give us a lot of freedom. Um, 
you know, Mr. Rupert always asked me for a wish, and I said, can you please ensure that there are no direct flights from Geneva to Dresden? <laughs> it's hard work for me because it takes me seven hours to get there, but it takes them seven hours as well. So um, now we have a lot of freedom, and, and, and trust me, uh, we can focus on fine watchmaking because I don't need to care about logistic. I don't need to care about uh, um, IT security, uh, cyber crime, um, IP cases. Uh, I don't need to work. I need to find a great expert to hire somebody in California or in New York. Um, all that is done by Richemont. So all the work that is not important for customer, but which actually takes a lot of time out of your calendar, they do. And we can focus on developing, producing, and distributing our fine, um, our fine watches. And I have no doubt, as long as Mr. Rupert is running the show, um, you know, in the good days it's you, in the bad days also you. So the responsibility is on the team. Not, you cannot uh, shy away and say, uh, I had to do. Yeah? Erstmal vielen Dank und uh, herzlich willkommen in New York. Oh, noch ein Deutscher. <laughs> <laughs> But my question is for you again as a as a business a business executive. I think the you know, how do you deal with the fact that you sometimes have to make decisions, for example, with the Odysseus, right? Where you know that probably for years people will not appreciate it, people will not see it, and you might even dilute the value of the brand. How do you excuse me, how do you deal with that? How do you how does the morale with the team deal with that? Look, it's, it's, I mean, let's be clear. First of all, you can't make a decision and believe that you make everybody happy. I mean, that's, that just doesn't work. Um, and secondly, decisions that may look stu stupid on the first glimpse, on the second glimpse look intelligent, and on the third, again, stupid. So forget about, you know, you make the ultimate decision and then you stick to it. Um, life is about finding compromises, finding about check and balances, finding about, you know, what works for you. And in the worst case, it's uh, short-term gain and long-term pain. I think these are the things that I believe you should really avoid. Um, so far, I always enforce mistakes, and I really mean that. I think any living organization has to create mistakes. Um, my famous philosopher Sterling Moss once said, um, if you've never been thrown out of a corner, you were never really fast. Uh, I think in business it's exactly the same. If you try to go the safe way, you'll end up nowhere anyhow. Um, so that's my take on decisions. Um, important is that you hear everything, you have a great team, you make sure that you listen to a great team, um, and then you do the best you can do in the heat of the moment. There are two consultants that we all wish we had and we never have. The one is distance and the other is hindsight. If you want to understand what I'm saying, watch a soccer game. There are 40,000 people that know exactly what they did wrong in that moment. Unfortunately, you know, you are there on the playing ground. You have to decide in milliseconds what to do. You don't have the distance. You don't have the overview. And, of course, you don't have hindsight. So, you know, that's, that's my take on it. Thank you. Hello. Um, for me, the most distinctive design that you make is the Langer one. It's the foundational design for me. Can you please explain something I'm very curious about? Why in your town of Glashütte is there another company that makes a watch which is remarkably similar to the Glashütte one, the Glashütte original Panamatic? Can you tell me, is there any history between the two companies? No. What do you think of that watch? Look, it's... A copy is the biggest form of a compliment, they say. 
look at it, it, and it's it's not a you know I mean the Langer one is a lot more than it looks on the first glimpse you know it's the golden ratio it's the perfect triangle it's the different areas it's that's why we redid the lung the Grand Langer one because in the first place we were a bit lazy we took the same movement and put it into a bigger case and you know we diluted the idea of it and that's why we reinvented it later on and made it perfect um, you can't prevent somebody from copying you. Um, there's, a, there's a limit to IP uh, regulations, and maybe at the time also Richmond decided to not go head on with Swatch Group. I don't know, it was before my time. Um, but there is a reason, you know, that there's one original, which is the Langer one, and that's it. Question in regard to your role, uh, give us a glimpse of what happens in your discussion at the board level in your office when it comes to balancing tradition with innovation. You always bound, I always feel like companies like yours, there's always this dichotomy between the two, and I'd love to know your th thoughts around mm -hmm. this. And mm -hmm. then um, looking back at the past 30 years, how has your supplier mix has changed in regard to in-house, German, and then outside of Germany? First of all, I do, don't see a conflict in tradition and innovation. Um, tradition for us is a value system. Um, that's the tradition. You know, we want to polish things. We want to hand assemble things. We want to decorate things. We want to go the extra mile. This is a value system. It has nothing to do with innovation. Innovation is what you do with that tradition. How do you bring that to the next level? Um, how, wh why, do you, why do you develop a tourbillon and then you can't adjust the time properly? That for me is always a great example. You know, for 280 years there was a tourbillon which is there to advance the accuracy of a, of a, of a watch and never ever you could adjust it properly. So in the worst case you were a minute late uh, just by adjusting it. That's a typical thing where we are very traditional and quite innovative. Um, so I don't, I don't see that as a challenge, that never stand still is really something which you can see throughout the company. And sometimes, trust me, it can drive you nuts because they never get ready. They always wanted to go a little extra bit. So eventually you have to make them, that's why I like Watches and Wonders or SIHH. There's a deadline, huh? So you work towards a deadline. Um, so that's the take on tradition and innovation. The second was supply chain. Supply. Sorry, D? Supply chain. It's very easy. You know, the movement is done in Glashütte. Um, the case is done either in Glashütte or in Switzerland. Um, the dials, some, the very complicated one, are done in-house enamel, uh, topograph, and so on and so forth. The rest we source. Um, alligators, we tried in the Müglitz, actually took cold in winter, so we get it from Louisiana. Um, and, and, and that's it, basically. And it hasn't changed. Funny enough, we still work with the first supplier for our cases. Um, and, and, you know, they... Uh, there's a reason for it. Let me share the reason. Why, do we do it? Why don't we do that in-house? We could. Not a problem. But the machines that you need to produce cases at our quality, they are very expensive. And the people that work on these machines are highly specialized. If you only produce 5,500 watches, you also don't need more cases. So you would build a machine park and you would recruit very, very good experts and after six weeks they wouldn't know what to do for the rest of the year. So that's why we decided to, we can do everything in-house, we did cases in-house, grand complication for example, but you know, that is what we leave to others. Our focus is on what we think is the most important uh, and that's the movement. All right, let's, uh, we'll have two more questions this evening and we'll go to the back of the room. We've been in the front here, so let's go here. Uh, hello, 
Hi. Uh, you mentioned about the waterproofness, and it, I, I'm just curious about uh, magnetism because we are very surrounded these days with all MagSafe and everything. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge problem. You're absolutely right. Um, it's again, you know, if you want to uh, ensure that no magnetism will hit your watch, there are only two ways. The one is use materials that don't magnetize. Unfortunately, then, you know, we are with the silicium part. We don't think that is craftsmanship. We just believe that is uh, mass production um, and takes away the beauty of fine watchmaking. That's our statement, and I really stick to it. It would make our life so much easier. You have no idea. You know, with these uh, silicium hair springs, the first is like the millions. Very expensive if you produce one, very inexpensive if you produce a lot. But, you know, there is no fight with regulating it because there's no, and, and, and we don't know what is happening to that in 20 years from now on because none of these watches is older than 20 years. The other is to put it into um, a soft iron case, but then you wouldn't see the movement anymore. So for the time being, at least we think it is rather under control to, to demagnify, uh, to, to demagnetize a watch is also not a miracle. Alkis, how long does it take? Half a minute? Half a minute from the expert. So, at it, in, in, and I agree, you know, you put it next to your iPad or next to your iPhone, I totally agree, but as I said, you know, that's, there's a limit to what you can do without taking the beauty of fine watchmaking away. Okay, we'll have the last question here in the back of the room. First off, uh, thank you again for taking the time to speak with us today. Uh, my question is around honey gold, um, sort of the genesis of the material, how Longa thinks about it, because there isn't any other alloy like it in the market today. Um, and it seems like for the most part, you're using it in limited edition, sort of special pieces. Um, is that sort of the strategy moving forward? Do you have other applications for it? And then finally, what is its relationship maybe to yellow gold and the way that you're using less yellow gold uh, as opposed to, say, pink gold and, white and the yeah. other materials? Yeah. So honey gold is a, is a patent that we own. That's why nobody else can use it. Um, it's a very nice color because it, you know, it does change daylight to, to artificial light. And it is from a soft white gold to a light pinkish gold. It's a very hard material, it's a lot harder than normal gold, and we only use it for limited editions for a reason. Um, to work with that material is very demanding. Um, and if a watch made out of honey gold comes into after sales and the face and, and the, 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 the case needs to be refurbished, you know how we normally do it. Uh, normally what we do is um, we laser all the dents and scratches uh, we apply the same material that uh, we use for the case and then we polish away what we put on too much. Unfortunately, with honey gold, because of the uh, composition, you must do that in a complete oxygen-free area. Um, and that is a lot harder to generate, a lot more work that goes into it, and there's a limit to our capacity. So that's why we'll only use that for limited editions and that will remain our strategy. We always have yellow gold in our, in our assortment, always had. We never stopped it. But of course, you do not produce what is not requested to the same. So we always have a Lange 1. We usually have a Saxonia. We usually have an 1815 in yellow gold. Um, but the days where we had basically a yellow gold version in every product family, you know, there was just not a demand for it. And if you don't have enough capacity, it is very stupid to produce watches that nobody wants. So that's why we are, you know, careful with yellow gold. It was once a very German, Austrian, Switzerland uh, acquired taste. Uh, it was never great in other countries. Only recently um, you see a little stronger demand on it. But as I said, our classic watches are still available in yellow gold. Okay, let's, let's give Mr. Schmidt another hand for an incredible lecture Thank tonight. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. So that, that's the end of our, our formal Q&A session, but if you have any other questions, I, I, I think uh, we may have some time. Uh, you can come up and, and say hi. So thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight, and we'll see you next month. Have a great night.